dwelling in the Loire area, which contained some of the first fiefs acquired by the royal power. This garden spot of France was thus singled out by destiny to blossom into legend through its prestigious architecture. Under the Valois rulers, the 15th and 16th centuries witnessed the metamorphosis of the feudal chateau into a country house set amid nature, gardens and water. The chateaus of the Middle Ages were hermetically sealed retreats. The Renaissance opened them up and decorated them, and the Loire Valley became one gigantic art atelier. The Loire and its tributaries were the background for these glamorous royal dwellings that ushered in a new era by imposing the Renaissance. When the chateaus changed their form, they also changed their functions. The gallery of the Chateau of Beauregard near Blois is a breathtaking marvel which concentrates this evolution in a single array of 362 portraits. All the individuals who made French history over a period of three centuries are portrayed here near the chateaus that they planned, built or inhabited, in which they were born or died and in which they led their love lives grouped together in a silent, dream-like kind of storytelling session. They are arranged in proper order, and this ideal court looks as if it were being presided over for all time by the monarch dominating each period. All the people we shall be meeting on our Loire Chateau pilgrimage are arranged here around Charles VIII, Francis I, Henry IV, Anne de Bretagne or Catherine de Medici. Oddly enough, also present are individuals who played parts in the international political events of their day, including Tamerlane, Emperor Charles V, Bajazet, Jules II, Henry VIII of England, and Soleiman the Magnificent. And also those who are memorable for various reasons and who rank with the world's great, Rabelais, Thomas More, Christopher Columbus. The art fancier who designed this gallery in the 17th century during the reign of Louis XIII must also have been an admirer of Plutarch. He collected illustrious men after the fashion of the day. We shall return again and again to this great picture album to identify through their chateaus the men who dwelt in them. The predestined Loire Valley had entered into history at the dawn of the kingdom. On the island of Amboise, Clovis met his rival Alaric before becoming sole master of Gaul and founding the most holy Christian kingdom in Reims. The Norman invasions delivered the final blow to the last structures of Charlemagne's empire. The monarchy withdrew to Paris, abandoning the power to the local nobility. Feudalism emerged out of the disorder and insecurity. The day of the fortified castle had dawned. The Chateau of Angers holds memories of the redoubtable Counts of Anjou, the most famous of whom was Fulk Nera, the Black Falcon, who, sometime around the year 1000, studded his conquests with a bristling array of innumerable towers. In the 13th century, one of his descendants, Henri Plantagenet, became King of England and master of half of France. In a final duel, Philip Augustus, King of France, recaptured from King Richard the Lionhearted all his fortresses. Angers, Chinon, 
and Losh. What these 17 towers evoke is hence not the mightiness of the Counts of Anjou. Rather, it is King Louis IX or Saint Louis, the man who built the chateau. A new dynasty, descended from Saint Louis, settled in Anjou. The most illustrious personage in this line of rulers who governed Naples, Lorraine and Provence was good King René. He it was who adorned Anjou's crown with its loveliest jewel, the series of 70 tapestries depicting the apocalypse produced from 1375 to 1380. This high warp tapestry is one of the world's most famous. Its presence here has made Anjou into a capital of ancient and modern tapestry. of Angers by the King of France was a prelude to the monarchy's future installation in the Loire country. The illustrious city of Chinon, a short distance away upstream on the banks of the Vienne River, is fraught with memories of Joan of Arc, together with evidence of the most gigantic layout of medieval military architecture. With its three juxtaposed chateaus, Chinon was the greatest stronghold in ancient France. Two major feudal houses, Anjou and Blois, were disputing the Loire country between them, and the origins of most of the feudal castles lay in the need to defend these great fiefs. But an endless four-cornered game was played between the monarchy, the Duchy of Brittany, and the two fiefs of Anjou and Blois. It was a strange and complex game whose outcome is a matter of record. Turn by turn, the French king destroyed the power of the Counts of Blois, of the Dukes of Brittany, and of the Counts of Anjou, who had become the kings of England. Chinon was a major stronghold in a major period of history, but it was also the setting that witnessed the full cycle of the Anglo-French War. It went from Henry II Plantagenet, who died there, to Joan of Arc, who met Charles VII there for the first time. It was in front of this fireplace, the sole vestige of the great hall in which the court gathered, that occurred the most famous scene in all of France's history the singling out of Charles VII by Joan of Arc from among the throng of courtiers. On this spot, the young King Charles VII received the visit of the humble shepherdess who announced that, in the name of the King of Heaven, she had come to assure him that he was the rightful heir to the throne of France. It was from Chinon that, shortly thereafter, she set forth at the head of a small army which delivered Orléans, thereby opening the way for Charles VII to be crowned in Reims and for Joan to be burnt at the stake in Rouen. But let us skim over history, the chateaus and the waterways to find King Charles VII ensconced at Loche on the Indre River. Fulknera's ancient fortress had long been an issue in the struggle between the kings of France and the Plantagenet, with the bitter sieges launched by Richard the Lionhearted and Philip Augustus. After its final conquest, it became one of the monarchy's major strongholds.
At that time, Losh, surrounded by at least one kilometer of fortified enclosure walls, was also a prison, and the kings strove to make it impregnable. The chateau became both celebrated and redoubtable, celebrated for its illustrious inmates, but also redoubtable because many of them perished there. The admirable church of saint Ours, a collegiate church located within the citadel, one of Romanesque architecture's most singular structures with its double pyramid of conical domes, also holds recollections of Joan of Arc, who prayed here on her way to meet the king. Charles VII eventually made Loche into a chateau for his court and set about embellishing it. The attractive royal dwellings that he erected ushered in a lighter, airier concept of residential abodes. These were the first that opened out onto terraces. History and its footnotes joined forces at Loche and the face of Agnès Sorel, whose sumptuous gisant this is, evokes the changes in living patterns, styles and customs that occurred during the waning Middle Ages. For it was with Charles VII and Agnès, his favorite, that there began the court life of a monarchy which had regained its status as Europe's most powerful. It is also the face of Agnès Sorel, the first of the official mistresses who were subsequently kept by the kings of France, that is supposed to have been the model for this Madonna and child ascribed to the school of Jean Fouquet. The Chateau of Saumur, an elegant medieval fortress, looks as if miraculously risen straight out of the illuminations in the famed Book of Hours of the Duc de Berry. For a long time, Saumur, a seemingly fragile yet redoubtable fort, was one of the Loire country's strategic keys and was the object of many wars waged between the counts of Anjou and Blois. In the wake of the building of the huge fortress of Angers, Saumur partially shed its military role and increasingly became recognized as one of the royal country houses of the Renaissance. Today, the chateau houses a fine museum of decorative art. who was also a poet and a musician, sang of Saumur as a chateau d'amour. The jousts and tournaments that he organized here are perhaps the remote origins of Saumur's destiny as a capital of equitation with its famous cadre noir horses and a museum of the horse. Louis XI scarcely had time to devote to the construction of buildings, yet we are indebted to him for Langer, built to defend the Loire against potential attacks from Brittany. Paradoxically enough, the Chateau of Langer later served as the setting for the marriage of Charles VIII, Louis XI's son, to Anne de Bretagne. This admirable chateau, a symbolic link between France and Brittany, seems to have been built only to provide a background for this single celebration. 
The Chateau of Langer is one of the last fortresses of the waning Middle Ages. Along with the oldest keep in France, it holds memories of the inevitable Fulk Nera, who built it sometime around the year 1000. The admirable outer wall is eminently representative of medieval military architecture in all its power and severity. The evolution of architecture and decoration is closely linked to social and political mutations. The major event of the late 15th century was the extinction of the great feudal houses. England eventually lost all its continental possessions. Peace at last had come. Langer, constructed in between two worlds, reveals on its inner facade the gentler artistry of the manor houses that were to follow. The interior of the chateau witnessed the first blooming of the Renaissance, which was beginning to bask in the signs of luxury and comfort. Rid of its enemies at home, the monarchy gradually abandoned the fortified castle and settled into the prestigious dwellings where it held forth for a whole century. The chateaus became decorated as befitted houses whose occupants enjoyed full leisure to indulge in the pleasures of art and the pastimes of peace. There was an abundance of art objects, of richly adorned furniture, wardrobes, chests, sideboards, fine faience and ceramic ware, and, most importantly, sumptuous collections of tapestries. The superbly furnished Chateau of Langer was bequeathed to the Institut de France and affords a clear idea of the interior of a 15th century manor house. This splendid hall brilliantly evokes the royal event that fixed it in history's memory for all time, the marriage of Charles VIII and Anne de Bretagne. Val de Loire, the fortified refuge of the monarchy during the times of troubles, became a kind of vast garden where the court moved from castle to castle. The Loire Valley no longer needed those excessively heavy defense works that had been made necessary by feudal warfare and the English occupation during the 100 years war. The chateau now lay open to the air, sun, river and gardens. Usset may well be the chateau that most accurately reflects the spirit of all these changes since it lacks one entire structure, namely a fourth wall, making it easier to proceed between terraces, grounds and main house. Thus amputated, the initial quadrilateral was destined to undergo the metamorphosis wrought by the Renaissance. Luxury took the place of strength. Unto the former fortress there was added such an array of adornments as to make it into a manner of fairyland castle, basking in unreal superabundance, the ideal setting for Perrault's famous tale of the Sleeping Beauty.
The feudal structure of Ussé is also found at Chaumont, wholly intact and devoid of useless adornments. It emerges as the typical example of a medieval chateau, completely closed in on itself, devoid of all ornamentation other than its defense system. The Chateau of Chaumont, which at its entranceway, with its severe military facade, emerges like a challenge to the fashion of its day, boasts a Renaissance courtyard flaunting the bold features of the last Gothic period. As at Ussé, the fourth wall was eliminated in order for the chateau to open out toward the river. The inside of the chateau is devoted to sidelights of history. Chaumont represents the epilogue of a dramatic event that occurred at Chenonceau. After Henry II's death, Catherine de Medici acquired Chaumont in order to wreak vengeance on Diane de Poitiers, the late king's favorite. The queen forced her rival to give up Chenonceau, Diane's favorite chateau, in exchange for Chaumont. According to legend, it was in Chaumont's great tower, in the room of Ruggieri, the queen's astrologer, that Catherine de Medici read in the stars the dire fates that awaited her three sons, Francis II, Charles IX, and Henry III, and the replacement of the Valois by the Bourbons on the French throne. The Chateau of Chaumont basks in a dual setting. It is closed off on the side facing inland and it opens onto the Loire. It is a shining example of the composite character of a structure that, although it was conceived in between two worlds, displays remarkable unity. At Villandry, where the garden is omnipresent, the metamorphosis became fully achieved. In the 16th century, the redoubtable keep, the sole vestige of the original defense system, was merely a symbol of the power of the nobility. Villandry's extraordinary grounds are a breathtaking illustration of the new art of living. They contain one of the unique curiosities of the Loire Valley in the form of a wondrous kitchen garden designed as an ornamental space for leisure time enjoyment, basking amid a stunning carpet of multicolored plants. This exceedingly elaborate creation, which combines gardening and the plastic arts, is the ultimate expression of the refinement of Villandry, since it favors aesthetics over utilitarian purpose. These alluring, doubly edible vegetables, first of all, provide a feast for the eyes. Villandry retains the geometrical structure and the complex symbolism of medieval gardens, and the themes of music and love govern the forms. The gardens were beginning to overflow the boundaries of their originally assigned closed-in central space. 
This marked the genesis of an evolution whose end result was Versailles. The beholder may feel that a chateau was merely the pretext for the setting and that it is the sights, the river, the trees, the hues and the flowers that determine the architecture. The site and the chateau of Amboise are rich with a storehouse of memories, perhaps the greatest array of all, since their record harks back to a Gallic oppidum or fortress which subsequently became a Roman castellum and eventually a feudal castle. Julius Caesar, Saint Martin and Clovis presumably slept here. Not until Charles VII's time did it become a royal chateau. From that time on, Amboise tells its own story through diverse recollections. There is the balcony of the conspirators a reminder of the tragic outcome of the Amboise conspiracy and the violent outbreak of the wars of religion. There is the Tower of the Minim, which holds memories of Emperor Charles V's visit and whose spiraling rise, the only one of its kind in the world, enabled riders to continue on horseback up to the top. There is Saint Hubert's chapel on the ramparts, a precious setting for a treasured relic, for it contains the tomb of Leonardo da Vinci, who died at Clos Lucet near Amboise, with Francis I at his bedside. And the mystic stag on the chapel's façade evokes the worship of Saint Hubert as a patron saint by the hunter kings. The heraldic emblems of Louis-Philippe d'Orléans remind us that he was the last king to dwell at Amboise. Over 1,000 years of history thus unfold the chronicle of the countless events for which Amboise was the setting. However, what interests us are only the 14 years of Charles VIII's reign, since it is to him alone that we owe Amboise. His father, Louis XI, had relegated his wife and children to Amboise. Charles retained a fondness for his childhood home, and once on the throne, he set about making it into a stupendous fortress palace. Charles VIII's chateau remains a wondrous example of what is known as the First Renaissance. This strange little ruler, who dreamt of conquering the Kingdom of Naples and the Empire of the Orient, launched the Italian wars that were to keep France in a state of belligerence for three reigns. His wanderlust and his fondness for encounters spurred Charles VIII on to undertake vaster concepts. Most importantly, he felt that a monarch's abode should surpass all the others in all manner of splendid ways. The royal destiny of this young king, the story of whose marriage at Langer to Duchess Anne the heiress to the Duchy of Brittany was marked by the deaths of all four of the children whom he had by this queen. Failing the existence of a royal heir, the crown would revert to his cousin Louis d'Orléans, who had fallen out of favour. Not only the crown, but also the queen, because under the terms of a treaty agreement, she would have to wed the king's successor in the event of her husband's demise. The couple's anguish lasted six years. With the birth of each child, hope was kindled anew, and each time it ended in tragedy, through to the final disaster. Charles VIII himself died young, aged 28, 
the victim of an accident in the chateau that he had made into a palace, still dreaming of conquering the world. The tidings of the king's death were brought to his successor, Louis d'Orléans, at Blois, where he was living in disfavor. He became Louis XII. From the outset, the Chateau of Blois seems to have been destined to perpetual reconstruction. It displays an odd juxtaposition of virtually every style somewhat resembling a manual of architecture. From its medieval origins through to the classical style, it has a bit of everything. With Louis XII's help, we move from the residence of a private citizen to that of a king. Louis XII had two reasons for trying to obliterate with Blois the work of his predecessor at Amboise. He had married the latter's widow, Anne de Bretagne, whose coat of arms is shown here, and in addition to the fact that Amboise was a sharp reminder of his period of disfavor, its style suddenly seemed outdated. Here, history repeated itself in every respect. In his turn, Louis XII relived the tragedy of Charles VIII. His three sons by Anne de Bretagne died in infancy, and his daughter, Claude de France, heiress to the maternal duchy of Brittany, married the king's successor, her cousin, who became Francis I. France thus became wedded to Brittany for the third time. Like Louis XII, Francis I was eager to erase the marks of his predecessors from Blois. The sumptuous wing that he began building in the first year of his reign stands out as a masterpiece of French 16th century architecture in its Italianized period. The famous staircase, a masterpiece of architectural ornamentation, a fabulous axis that, for the first time, had been placed on the outside, is a tower that has been emptied, adorned and carved, polarizing everything, the ideal instrument for occasions of large gatherings. Of this singular epoch, Francis I, whose personal symbol, a golden salamander, is found everywhere, was the greatest builder. The loggia facade, which lets the Chateau of Blois open out expansively towards the town, is a clean break with the sealed-in, forbidding nature of medieval outer walls, thereby accurately symbolizing the victory of the Renaissance. The fleur de lys, the salamander and the ermine are not just gratuitous ornaments. This armorial profusion marked the end of the feudal world and a quasi-achievement of French unity. Francis I's glorious reign was soon to be succeeded by a long period of unrest that was complicated by the dynastic problem of three monarchs who left no posterity. The three sons of Henry II and Catherine de Medici succeeded one another on the French throne. Francis II, Charles IX and Henry III. The period was dominated by the enigmatic, legendary figure of Catherine de Medici. She died in the Chateau of Blois at the heart of the tragedy that her Florentine sense of intrigue expressed here in her secret drawer cabinet had been unable to ward off. In the twilight of the Valois dynasty, at the end of the vast melee of civil and religious warfare, the Chateau of Blois was the setting for one of French history's greatest tragedies, the assassination of the Duc de Guise in the king's bedroom. The real drama lay in the gothic decor of the state's general room. The two rival factions that were rendering asunder Henry III's France were led by Henri de Guise, the Catholic leader, and by Henri de Bourbon, 
the future Henry IV and leader of the Huguenots. The so-called War of the Three Henrys threatened to tear France apart. Henry III, who had to flee Paris because of the Guise rebellion, hoped to remedy matters by convening the States General in the main hall of Blois. But the Duc de Guise was bent on getting the crown, and the assembly was made up only of his partisans. Unable to exert his authority, the monarch had to resign himself to assassinating the two enemies who were his greatest threats, the Duc de Guise and the latter's brother, the Cardinal of Lorraine. The eventual consequence of this double execution was the murder of Henry III himself and the advent of the great reign of Henry IV, the sole survivor of this fratricidal struggle between three princes. The monarchy would thenceforth be officiating in Paris, and history would be happening but seldom in the Loire Valley. From the time of Francis I to the reign of Henry IV, the entire valley of the Loire had gradually become occupied by the itinerant court whose wandering verged on vagabondage. The court betook itself from one chateau to another, depending on the caprices of fancy, the pleasures of the hunt, and the political situation. It was like a whole city on the march, forming an enormous, picturesque, noisy caravanserai, transporting its furniture, linen, paintings, wardrobe, relics, and archives, because it was actually a state apparatus that was on the move, followed by members of all the trades and by horses and hounds. It is hard to conjure up a clear picture of this immense horde which, when it arrived somewhere, found only an empty shell and which, at its departure, left an empty shell behind it. Francis I, a great creator of beauty, passionately devoted to architecture, could not be content with redecorating premises haunted by his predecessors. He built Chambord, an abode designed to be a showcase for his mark alone. Chambord is the unique masterpiece of a kind that has no other examples, nor any imitations, the image of an amazing reign. Chambord, the ultimate in royal dwellings, heralded the advent of Versailles by its sheer size. It boasts 440 rooms and by the regularity of its symmetrical layout. It looms like the swan song of medieval symbolism, the perfect expression of Renaissance theatricality. The innovation was of a political nature, and if this palace is a stage set, that is because the monarchy itself had become a spectacle. The roof terraces and chimneys, a triumph of the lyric flowering of Italian-style ornaments, stand around a 32-meter skylight tower up which winds the world's most famous staircase, whose design is ascribed to Leonardo da Vinci. This famed double spiral stairway, with its two spirals that are superposed but never meet, remains a technical achievement of rare beauty. Chambord, conceived by the rapturous enthusiasm of a young prince drunk with glory, is actually a sort of dream poised halfway between the Loire country and Italy. Over the years, however, history proved stronger than the king's will. The setbacks, sorrows and dangers incurred by France in its war against Emperor Charles V called Francis I back to Paris, and he eventually became attached to Fontainebleau, which was nearer. The kings thenceforth stayed only for brief periods at Chambord. None of Francis I's successors ever succeeded in decorating the huge chateau. One hundred years after its abandonment, Louis XIV pitted his youthful glory against the nostalgic shadow of his remote predecessor by giving lavish entertainments at Chambord, planned and staged by Molière and Lully.
Two more centuries passed, and after the Franco-Prussian War of 1870, the great glamorous chateau was the setting for the monarchy's last attempt at a comeback in the person of Henry V, the so-called Comte de Chambord, who rang down destiny's final curtain on several centuries of history. Total abandonment followed, making Chambord into what Alfred de Vigny likened to a magic castle. He wrote, It is as if, constrained by some wondrous lamp, an eastern genie had kidnapped it during one of the thousand and one nights and had removed it from the realm of the sun in order to conceal it in the realm of mist. After the period of the feudal castles and the great royal chateaus of the Renaissance, a new era had dawned, that of the manor houses, dwellings of varying degrees of lavishness belonging to private citizens who erected buildings patterned on those of the monarch. The chateau of Azé le Rideau emerges today as the purest masterpiece of a new concept of architecture and life. The feudal castles were made for concealment, the royal chateaus were designed for showing off on a transient basis. The manor house was meant to be lived in for setting up housekeeping. For Asile le Rideau, which is so famous today, was not a royal chateau. Far from it. It was built by a financier named Gilles Berthelot, whose wife supervised the construction with all the artistic insight and practical knowledgeability of a true lady of the Renaissance. This costly indulgence boded ill for its owner, who was president of the audit office. He had to flee abroad to escape being hanged. Under those conditions, the medallions of kings and queens of France on the ceiling of this handsome staircase were an utterly superfluous homage paid to the power. Once confiscated, Azé le Rideau did not, however, become Azé le Royal. Francis I, of course, paid it a visit and doubtless admired it. But finding nothing he could add to it, he gave it to the captain of his guards. The delightful manor house eventually deserted the confines of history and entered the realm of art and architecture. It was acquired by France's fine arts ministry and since 1906 has housed a museum of Renaissance art. Azé le Rideau is incomparable for the harmony and gracefulness of its proportions, in addition to being the ultimate in narcissistic abodes. It is hard to realize that the double image of the form and its reflection belongs to time, and that so long a time has passed and so much water has flowed by in the stream since the house was completed in about the year 1525. The immateriality of Azé le Rideau borders on eternity. The amazing chateau of Chenonceau is another house on a river, the Cher, which serves as the setting for a jewel. Chenonceau is truly a chateau of women. Over a span of four centuries, exactly six women acted each in her turn as its project supervisors, from the time of its construction to that of its renovation.
construction also was begun by Catherine Brissonnet, who erected it on the piers of a mill, and it found its true destiny when Diane de Poitiers ordered a bridge built spanning the Cher. Its final version came into being when Catherine de Medici conceived the idea of constructing a gallery on the bridge. Chenonceau was too attractive a place for the court to be bidden there, except for the lavish entertainments that Catherine de Medici managed to provide despite the troubled times, the insecurity of the highways, and the perpetual deficit of the royal treasury. And Chenonceau in itself is also a feast, the most admirable insertion of architecture and gardens in an aquatic landscape, and doubtless the only dramatic events that occurred here were the sheddings of tears by all the women who had to bid it farewell, forced to flee because of financial ruin, falling from grace or widowhood. Intangible and graceful, miraculously protected from history's turmoil, Chenonceau, thanks to Madame Dupin, who was Jean-Jacques Rousseau's hostess here, emerged unscathed from the upheavals of the revolution with virtually all of its interior decorations and furniture intact. Thus, this fragile house on the river, impassive and aloof, allows time and events to glide by with the same utter tranquility as the Cher River that flows beneath its arches. Its decoration and furnishings, the art objects and paintings, prompt us to dream that here nothing can change no matter what happens, and that its many different owners were merely the servants or slaves of some mysterious prodigy. Court life, which had begun in the Loire Valley with Charles VII and Agnès Sorel, continued here during the reign of Henry II, whose mistress, Diane de Poitiers, and wife, Catherine de Medici, fought over this abode, one of the most original ones in the whole world. The singular splendor and the unique ambiance of Chenonceau stem from the fact that it was neither entirely a royal dwelling nor, of course, entirely the dwelling of an ordinary citizen. A queen's dwelling is not a king's dwelling. In a queen's dwelling, Luxury develops with more grace and less pomp and display, and the decoration here is less designed to dazzle the beholder than to make him linger. This may well be what ensures an also of its abidingness as compared with the showy, overly political aesthetics of power. And it was no doubt Catherine de Medici who first realized that men are governed by beauty. Queens of France, fleeting shadows, some of whom we know only through their portraits, have lent their names to this formal bedchamber. It is this room, or the adjoining one, that evokes memories of Ronsard, a courtier and the Prince of Poets, who was frequently responsible for arranging the memorable entertainments staged at Chenonceau by Catherine de Medici in honor of her three sons who became kings of France. No matter. The echoing names that grace these bedrooms, those of Gabriel d'Estrée, Henry IV's favorite, or of César de Vendôme, their son, evoke only the transient guests of an evanescent history. Should we admit that this marvel is unfinished? This gallery was designed to span the river in order to lead to another building that would have been symmetrical to the one on the opposite bank of the Cher. The Philibert de Lorme gallery, with the idea of two buildings joined at an angle by a wing, heralded the pure, regular outlines of the classical style. 
Of this style, one of the most perfect examples is the Chateau of Cheverny, which dates from the early 17th century. Hureau de Cheverny was the son of one of Henry IV's chancellors. He was exiled to his home territory, which has just been made into an earldom, and he caused this chateau to be built in a single undertaking, no doubt to help himself forget about his fall from grace. Indeed, the luxuriousness of his noble residence expressed sheer nostalgia. It is a kingly dwelling without a king. The Countess of Cheverny, in a portrait by Mignard, casts an Olympian gaze on the impeccable setting that she has been protecting for three centuries. The interior of the chateau is in every respect the most outstanding and most perfect example of the Louis XIII style existing in France. It forms, at the end of our itinerary, the end of a certain evolution in the art of living. The majestic equilibrium of the decoration testifies to a hitherto unknown degree of comfort, and the leatherwork, woodwork, fabrics and painted panels add warmth to the lines of a style whose fullest flowering would not come about until Versailles. It is hard to say whether all these sumptuous details were a species of consolation for the Count of Cheverny's fall from grace, but the dining room decoration is a tribute to a secret dream life with scenes from Don Quixote done by Jean Monnier, one of the painters of Beauregard, and with a superabundance of heraldic bearings which make Cheverny seem somehow chimerical. The fine painted decorations and the tapestries in the guardroom prompt the conclusion that the master of this estate felt himself to be a nobleman of no minor rank, for in no royal palace had such a room ever displayed such magnificence. Here, in the inevitable royal bedroom, the luxury is surely prodigious. It is the ideal model of all the bedrooms that were going to be installed during the next two centuries, and it has remained unoccupied. It seems to have been designed in honor of some imaginary monarchy, but no monarch ever deigned to occupy the king's bedroom. In addition to all this, Cheverny is also, and perhaps most importantly, the art of the hunt. Not only because this chateau houses a museum of hunting, but also because traditional hunting to the hounds still goes on here, and the actual pack is still very much in evidence. come to the end of our journey, let us render homage to the hunt, since so many of these beloved chateaus owe their very existences to it by the grace of the royal hunters who erected them or embellished them for the sole purpose of pursuing the stag through the forests, fields and ponds of the Loire Valley. Let us take another glance at these chateaus, not for their historical content, but for their secret life, the dream life that is brought to them through the sound and light shows in summer. And, 
on these lovely banks of the Loire, which, in the words of Balzac, bear the marks of royal tenderness from place to place, we will let the play of light silently proclaim the glory of these beloved stones which are singled out and transfigured by a perpetually ongoing feast and which are, to again quote Balzac, a complete, accurate picture of the great representation of the customs and lives of nations that we call architecture. <laughs>